John Aiken, head of research at Barclays, who covers the financial sector. John, it is great to be with you. Uh, let's just talk your initial take on this change up, bringing in Scott Thompson, who didn't rise through the ranks of the bank, but as a board member, certainly is familiar with how the bank works. Good morning, Amber. I'd just like to say it's great to have you back. But yes, the uh, the move this morning was surprising, not necessarily in context of, of Brian um, retiring, but more so that this is the first time, at least in my memory, that one of the big six banks have actually gone outside of their organization for a new chief executive officer. Now, obviously, the market is taking a bit of a, a negative reaction to this. But honestly, as you pointed out, I think that Mr. Thompson's time on the board, uh, both with not only his experience with Scotia, but also in terms of developing the strategy in conjunction with the management team, goes a long way from our estimation to uh, to alleviate some of these concerns. And keep in mind that um, you know the Canadian banks these days are very broad, diverse organizations. And Mr. Thompson has a lot of experience in terms of not just managing uh, companies, but also his exposure to Latin America, which, as you pointed out, is one of the key differentiators for Scotia. Well, let's talk about some of those challenges for Bank of Nova. Scotia. I mentioned that it has underperformed the broader bank index since 2013 by a pretty wide margin. Can you take us through what some of those issues are and what I know we have a lot more questions and answers about uh, the leadership change up, but what you as an analyst and what investors want to hear about any potential strategic shakeup? Yes. So, I mean, the, the one of the one of the factors that has uh, caused Scotia's relative underperformance against the group really has been its focus on Latin America, which longer term has fantastic growth potential. But over the intervening periods, they've had some issues with the operations in terms of getting expenses under control, and more recently, um, more concerns about the the region's near term growth and concerns about credit quality as, as those are being normalized. Now, one of the things that one could lead to the Conclusion is that new management team is going to have a, a you know, broad change in strategy, and Latin America or the, interna or the international operations definitely come into that, that purview. That being said, as I said at the beginning, given the fact that Mr. Thompson actually has experience, has been part of the evolution of Scotia's strategy, I'm not looking for anything dramatic, and I, I really don't think that they're going to do anything dramatic, such as divesting of, of any of their major Latin American operations. You've got buys on Bank of Montreal, TD, and Canadian Western Bank. You're a hold on Bank of Nova Scotia. What would it take for you to get more constructive on the name? We, we definitely want to see improvements on international, both in terms of uh, the top line growth as well as expenses. Now, granted, the last couple quarters, we've definitely seen some improvements in, in those measures. But, you know, we, we really need to see that uh, accelerate in order to um, see the relative performance of Scotia move against the uh, against the group. We're not we're not dramatically negative on Scotia because we do think that uh, the longer term strategy definitely holds holds merit. It's just a little bit of the execution in the near term, not necessarily management mistakes, but just the operating environment that they have in, in the international operations a little more challenged than, than some other some of their peers. Let's also talk, I guess, about the macro environment that the new CEO will be stepping into. It's not just the challenges that Scotia has, but it's a whole new ball game for these Canadian banks that are, you know, seeing a rising rate environment, which, you know, in some respects is very welcome, but also that risk of recession, questions about the housing market uh, and whether there are credit vulnerabilities there. What are you watching for uh, as we talk about this new macro environment for the Canadian banking sector? Yeah, Amber, you make a great point because we're in this kind of unusual period where the banks are benefiting from the initial rate hikes. We're seeing last quarter, finally, the, the margin expansion on their interest income that uh, has been long awaited for. And that is expected to continue just be based on the way the dynamics of their balance sheets and the way that the banks operate their, their operations, that we are going to see top line growth from margin expansion. The problem is, though, is, is as you allude to, the rising rates also puts pressure on the economy and what what how quickly is economic growth going to be reeled in do we have you know we have the potential for recession it's not necessarily being called for by everybody on the street but that's definitely one of the things that we need to look for so right now you can when you look at the valuation of the banks the market is definitely 
um, taking a much longer term outlook in terms of the uncertainty of the credit losses that are potentially coming down the pipeline versus the near term top line growth that, that we're experiencing. And now as, as, a, as a new management team coming in, as well as for uh, Scotia's peer group, the banks have to be very cautious in terms of making sure that they're uh, on top of their credit adjudication, making sure that all of their, their loans are uh, performing and, and they're doing the best that they can, but also making sure that you're not expanding your operations too quickly in terms of expenses in case the uh, uh, in case you start to have losses coming through from, from credit losses and also potentially slower top line growth if we actually do see a slowdown in the economy and loan volumes uh, start to decline. Do you expect that? What is the housing risk for Canada's bank sector? Right now, the the housing, the Canadian residential mortgages uh, that the banks are, are still lending to are still quite solid, and we're not expecting it really any deterioration in credit quality. The biggest impact on the banks is going to be the obvious slowdown in residential mortgage loan growth. And while we're expecting that to the the growth to slow, we do expect the growth to remain positive. What we're looking for um, broader is uh, what's going to happen in terms of the commercial and the corporate lending which has really picked up the slack over the last couple quarters from the slowdown of residential mortgage growth. If that starts to ease, then we're definitely going to have some top-line uh, pressure on growth for the banks. But right now, at least for the foreseeable future, called the next six months, the outlook actually still looks very strong for the banks. It, when you go into what the latter part of 2023 is going to look like in terms of do we have higher unemployment, does that put pressure on credit, that's where the uncertainty really is very difficult to call at this stage of the game. You know, a lot of people come to this sector for dividends and dividend growth. The yield is not bad, uh, close to four and a half percent. How do the banks manage their dividend policy with all of these issues at play? Yeah, we, we've gone to a, a bit of conformity in terms of the dividend policies for the banks where their, their payout ratios or their, their guided payout ratios are between 40 and 50 percent. And the, the group is running just a, around 45 percent. And I think that's consistent where you're you're not going to see the banks ease off on that in the anticipation of something that might happen, because they do believe that with that payout ratio, they still have enough to fund growth. Uh, and right now, the capital positions are actually very strong. Um, I would actually say even heading into this uncertainty, I would argue the bank's capital ratios are uh, are probably in excess of what they what they truly need. And we've seen uh, in past times of stress, I point to the global financial crisis in particular, where it was the absolute last thing that the banks would do is to cut their dividend. And I, I even though there's some pressure uh, coming from uh, potential macroeconomic headwinds, I don't think that even a small bar recession is going to be that dramatic in terms of the impact on the bank's balance sheets, and they should be able to weather the storm quite nicely without any impact on the dividends. And honestly, as long as earnings are growing even modestly, you will still see uh, growth in the dividends.